Hi, Confirmation students, and hi to family members who maybe are uh, watching along with them. Um, I welcome you to this lesson of Confirmation, a virtual lesson that um, I'm going to present on a very central um, figure in our faith, Jesus. Jesus is uh, the center of our identity as Christian people of faith. We hear Christ right in that name um, for ourselves. We are those who follow Christ. We are those who follow Jesus. Uh, we're going to think a little bit in this lesson about um, the historical Jesus, what we know about Jesus, and then um, theologically uh, who Jesus is for us and what that means in our identity as Christians, um, as those baptized in the name of Jesus and um, what that means for us and how we understand who God is um, for us and in and for the world. Uh, so Jesus is our topic uh, for this lesson. Some of the things that we do know historically about Jesus, we're going to start there. Um, Jesus, we know, was a Jewish man. He was born um, somewhere in the region of Judea during the last years of the ruler um, Herod the Great, which means by our modern reckoning of time, um, he was born roughly around the year 6 BCE. BCE stands for Before Common Era. Jesus was raised in a simple Jewish peasant family before setting out on an itinerant ministry, meaning he traveled around um, on foot he attracted disciples in his travels. He produced miraculous acts, and he gave a number of memorable sermons. It all drew attention from lots of different folks. We also know that Jesus was arrested and tried by both um, civil and religious authorities on charges ranging from blasphemy to treason. Jesus, we know too, was crucified. He was crucified during the reign of Herod the Great's son, Herod Antipas, um, sometime between the year 30 and 36 CE. Here's a really simple Bible timeline just to help us place Jesus' life and ministry in the greater biblical story. Now, this timeline is really simple. Um, it's simplified. It's not necessarily even in the perfect order of when different books of the Bible were written. For example, many of Paul's letters were actually shared and delivered before some of the Gospels were written down and shared um, with churches, with early Christian churches. Um, but a lot of what we know historically about Jesus um, comes from Paul's letters and, of course, from the Gospels which are all about Jesus. Um, but there are also other historical writings that mention Jesus too. So we've been talking a little bit about the historical Jesus. A lot of that information um, is, is validated and supported and, and um, written down in, in other historical writings. Um, so we, we know a lot about this historical Jesus. And then in addition, in our biblical texts, we, we learn about um, Jesus as Savior, as Lord, we learn um, as those who follow him, as people who believe in him as God's very self-present. Um, you'll notice in this timeline where the Gospels take place right at the beginning. They're planted right in the beginning of the New Testament, as you can see. Um, and then here's that Old Testament sort of story to place that as well, just to give you an idea even of some times and dates. Very, very simplified here timeline, but um, it places that biblical story for us to see the Old Testament and then that New Testament unfold. Okay, so what are some of the things that you know about Jesus? When you think of Jesus, what stands out to you? I'm going to ask you to pause this video now, and um, I want you to make a list of everything that you can think of, that you know or remember about Jesus. 
If you are watching this video with other family members, you can work together to make that list too. You don't have to spend a lot of time on it. Just take a minute or two to write down the things that come to mind when you think of Jesus. Okay, I hope you were able to come up with some good things on your list. I am sure you were. One of the central things as Christians that we believe about Jesus involves a sort of paradox. What is a paradox? Well, a paradox is when two seemingly opposing truths or ideas are both true at the same time. Like maybe you remember hearing in church or learning in confirmation something Martin Luther taught us that we are both sinner and saint at the very same time. We sin and make mistakes and at the same time we are God's saints in and for the world. We are forgiven sinners. We are saints. This sinner-saint distinction is sort of a paradox, right? And I think Jesus' identity is sort of a paradox too. Namely, one of the central um, tenets that we teach in the Christian church is that Jesus is both fully human and fully divine. How can this be? Jesus was fully human and fully divine all at the same time. We're going to talk about that for most of the rest of this lesson. So I know that you made a list about things that you know about Jesus, right? I have no way of knowing if you actually paused this video to do that because I am only fully human. But I'm hoping you did because now I want you to take a look at your list and I want you to try to identify whether each thing or attribute you wrote down is more about Jesus' humanity or Jesus' divinity, his human traits or his divine traits. So go ahead and pause this video again to write down either the word human or divine next to each note on your list. I hope that went well for you. I'm going to add just a few ideas or characteristics um, to your list, unless perhaps you've already named them, of course. So here's another little additional list. We know Jesus was a preacher. We know he was a teacher and a friend. We know that he was born of Mary and Joseph, right? These are all human characteristics. We know that he forgave people. We know that he was crucified, right? We know he washed the disciples' feet. He welcomed unimportant people. He slept. He felt tired. He got frustrated. He welcomed sinners. He ate, right? Very human um, tendencies. He was holy. I put a question mark. Is that a human trait or a divine trait? Um, certainly a divine trait, but maybe, maybe human too. If we think of holy in the sense of being set apart, um, God makes us holy in our discipleship and in uh, the ways in which we live our faith. We also know that there are some very distinctly divine characteristics uh, about Jesus. He uh, was a miracle healer, son of God. He walked on water. He forgave sins. He was resurrected. He turned water into wine. He calmed a storm. He appeared after his resurrection. He fed 5,000 people. Um, he was, in a unique and special way, very connected to God. He was holy, right? Um, perhaps some of these characteristics, maybe some on the list, fit both. Um, maybe they're debatable. It's uh, um, really wonderful kind of fodder for a conversation. So I hope you'll have some further conversation. And as you come to small group, the next time we can chat further as well. As Christians, our tradition teaches us that Jesus was fully divine and fully human. In essence, we believe that Jesus was and is as completely God as God and as utterly human as you and me. That is, Jesus experienced the same emotions and physical realities that we experience. This dual nature of Jesus, fully human and fully divine, is a belief that grew in the church, in the early church, but only after 
the church rejected many other beliefs about Jesus' identity and labeled them as heresies. Heresy is just an opinion that is contrary to the accepted belief. For fun, if you are interested, you can look up some of those rejected theories and see what you think about them. Here are just a few. Take a moment now to write down um, one or two if you wish so that you can uh, learn a little bit more. Okay, as Lutheran Christians, we are taught that God became fully human in order that we might know God more fully. In becoming fully human, we can trust that God is not far off from us, but knows us intimately, knows this whole human living thing that we are doing intimately, even the experience of death, the end of our living. And because of that, we can trust that God stands with us in every experience, not just as a divine presence, but as one who knows our pain and suffering too, our joy and love, our friendship, our loss and betrayal, all of it. And maybe most importantly, we know that God chooses us in all of our humanity, our human frailty, and loves us, not in spite of our humanity, but because of it. This, by the way, is a picture of, of what the historical Jesus most likely looked like. A lot of our art that we see that portrays Jesus tends to portray Jesus as more of a reflection of our own um, ethnicity, the ways in which we look as um, North Americans. Jesus was not a North American. He was not a blonde, blue-eyed, um, tall uh, person at all, right? Jesus um, looked probably a lot more like this illustration of him. All right, we are going to spend um, our last few minutes digging into the Bible. If you don't have your Bible, you can use your special power of pause right now to go and grab it. We are going to turn to Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. You'll find it on page um, 1292. And I'm going to read those verses now as you follow along. But first, I have to use my power of pause to go and get my own Bible that I forgot. Okay, I'm back with my Bible. And um, I am going to read those verses now. Um, Philippians 2, beginning with verse 5. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Biblical scholars um, think actually that verses six through eight were actually part of an ancient hymn. And when you look at those words, it does sort of sound like a hymn of sorts, doesn't it? It reminds me of songs that we sing to help us remember who Jesus is and what's central to who we are. Like maybe, for example, a well-known song, Jesus Loves Me. It reminds us of who God is and who we are to God. This passage that I just read suggests to us that God chose to become fully human. What does that choice tell us about God? Well, I think that God must desire to be close to us, right? To know us, to connect with us. Now let's take just a quick look um, at the orange box that's right next to those verses we just read in our Bibles. We proclaim that Jesus was fully divine and fully human, not partly human or sorta human. And that means Jesus 
showed us what a human life is meant to look like. This passage gets right to it. Because Jesus humbled himself and emptied himself to serve us, we're called to imitate Jesus. We humble ourselves to serve others. What are some of our best human qualities? I think a lot of what we see in Jesus, we see too in our very best human qualities, right? What do you think? Let's turn now to another scripture passage, Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 18, and you'll find that on page 1297. I'll read. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. Now let's turn back one page and read the contents in another orange box. For a lot of people, even a lot of Christians, it's very appealing to talk about Jesus as a good person who lived a long time ago, whom a lot of people liked. As Christians, we confess that, yes, Jesus showed us the perfect way to be human, but that's because Jesus was also fully God. That means that Jesus wasn't a man injected with God-like wisdom or a hybrid who was human some of the time and God at other times. It means Jesus was there, of one being with the Father and the Holy Spirit at the beginning of time. Jesus is God, and through him all things were made. This means Jesus is the source of all creation. So anything good you can think of begins and ends with Jesus. If Jesus is the invisible God, what can we know about God? Well, for one thing, if Jesus is the fullness of God, then we know God is loving and forgiving. That's what we see in uh, the the human person of Jesus, right? Love, grace, mercy, forgiveness. We know that God cares about justice because that's what we see in Jesus. We know that God um, cares about people who are suffering, struggling, those who are sick, poor, hungry, because Jesus spent his whole ministry caring about people so that we know God does Two, God cares about us when we are struggling, suffering, when we are sick. God cares about us. God suffers with us. If Jesus is the image of the invisible God, can we assume that God is male because Jesus was male? I think you probably know how I will answer that. Of course not. Actually, we can find all kinds of female imagery for God in the Bible, too, and non-human imagery as well, right? We come to know the character of God in the ways in which we know Jesus, his story, his ministry, his life, his death, his resurrection. To conclude this brief lesson... I want to leave you with just a couple of extra questions to ponder or to just keep in the back of your mind this next week. Maybe bring some thoughts with you um, to our next in-person small group gathering if you wish. Why would God choose to become human? That's a deep question for us to consider. If you were God, would you? Why or why not? Think too about that. Thank you for your attention and for this time that you've committed to this lesson. I can't wait to see you in person soon. Until then, peace be with you. And remember, 
you are a child of God forever. See you soon.